I'm interviewing Dr. Joseph Mountjoy from the Anthropology Department at UNCG about his time here and what he remembers. Today is January the 1st, 2018. So we'll just start at the beginning with um, when and where were you born? I was born in central Illinois, mm -hmm. in the city of Lincoln, Illinois. Mm -hmm. Although my hometown was Atlanta, Illinois. Okay. Most people don't know there's an Atlanta in Illinois. I was disappointed when I found out they had hauled me down to the hospital in Lincoln to be born. Uh, I would rather have been born in Atlanta, Illinois, but mm -hmm. that's neither here nor there, 1941. 1941. Yeah, you didn't have much choice in the matter. No, in terms no, of I, didn't have a, I didn't have a lot of choice, but if I could have voted, I would have. <laughs> uh, but uh, it was in Atlanta, Illinois, rural farming towns, mm -hmm. uh, 1,350 people mm -hmm. in the town. There's probably 1,450 people now. Mm -hmm. <laughs> they don't tend to grow that much. On Route 66. Okay. The famous route. Yeah. Ran Chicago to St. Louis, so we could go to the Cubs games in Chicago mm -hmm. or the Cardinals games in St. Louis, or, or rarely keep going out into the Southwest. Sure. But it was it was a nice place to grow up, uh, very safe. Um, the kids would run around town and everybody would keep an eye on them. And mm -hmm. not that there weren't problems, there were crime and so forth. But uh, compared to big city life, and uh, you know, it was not exactly Mayberry RFD, but it was it was a, a nice place to grow up. Mm -hmm. Were your parents farmers? Uh, well, it was an interesting wrinkle. My grandfather uh, and my grandmother came from a, a farming family. He started a hybrid seed corn business there. Mm. But my father went to the University of Illinois uh, and got a degree, a bachelor's degree in geology and went out to work in Hobbs, New Mexico in the oil fields. Oh. He uh, did not wind up in the service because he had a medical problem, a slight indication of spina bifida that never caused him any problems, mm -hmm. but they wouldn't take him in the service mm -hmm. and then they gave him a 4F deferment mm -hmm. so that he could uh, keep on at the farm, which at the farm at the time, and I've jumped a little bit before. closer to what was going on, uh, he graduated from the University of Illinois and then he got a job on the oil rigs in mm -hmm. the southwest and that's where he met my mother. Mm -hmm. uh, she was University of New Mexico, she was majoring in communications and archaeology, strangely enough. Hmm. And her family, she was born in Pueblo, Colorado. and then. Her father was in charge of the oil fields there in Hobbs, New Mexico. And as they told it to me, her parents went to see a local play, a community play, I guess it was. Mm -hmm. And my father was in the play. Oh. And she came home from school and they said, you really ought to meet this guy. We saw him in a play. And they arranged the meeting, <laughs> and the rest is history, I guess. They, uh, everything was going along just fine. But uh, my grandfather, who was head of the hybrid seed corn company, suffered an ac accident in a grain bin and lost one of his eyes. Oh. And because there were only two children, my aunt, aunt and my father, my grandmother asked my father to come back and help out save the family business mm -hmm. until my grandfather could recuperate. And essentially my grandfather never recuperated, he got other problems to the extent that he could take over the business again. Mm -hmm. And so my father was sort of stuck there. Okay. And that's when the family began. And that's when, yeah, I had a, a sister, younger sister, she's deceased. Uh, and I spent a lot of time on the farm rather than in the town of Atlanta 
uh, as did my sister with my grandparents. Mm -hmm. And it was really my grandfather who was interested in anything the Indians did. Uh, he was interested in going out and collecting Indian artifacts mm -hmm. and took me out as soon as I could walk in the fields with him. I was, as I recall, five years old mm -hmm. and found my first Indian, he would call it an arrowhead. It wasn't an arrowhead, it was a dart point. Uh, but I'm sure he planted it for me sure. and guided me in the direction <laughs> and to get me hooked. You can see what happened. Mm -hmm. He got me hooked. Yeah. But he taught me about geology. He was very interested in collecting rocks. Uh, he had a whole porch with a wall the po and the rocks that he collected in trips to the southwest and northern Mexico mm -hmm. were in there. He um, would take me out mushroom hunting and so I learned to be a mushroom hunter with him and he taught me about local plants and uh, animals and so forth. So I've I owe an awful lot of what I have done and become to the seeds that were planted by my grandfather. And as we know, this is usually the case. When you're really little, yeah. somebody gets to you and, and that sort of sets the thing. Yeah, you get the bug and then you just, yep. follow, uh, it. You just follow it continually. Yep. So when you were up looking at colleges and applying, were, is that the direction you were immediately thinking you'd be studying? Well, what happened was that I started out not a very good student in high school. Okay. Also, the fact that my parents got divorced didn't, didn't help. Sure. But uh, I had to settle down like in my sophomore year. My freshman year was not good at all mm -hmm. uh, because I was interested in attending the University of Illinois. And the University of Illinois is a land-grant school. Mm -hmm. And at that time, and it may be still today, uh, they would accept any student in the state who was in the upper 20% of their class. Mm -hmm. So with a lousy first year, mm -hmm. I had to really, really fight to be able to get into the upper 20% of my class. Yeah. There were only 27 students in the class. Right. So I was looking at who was ahead of me <laughs> and how I could get ahead maybe of them. move up a little more sure. quicker. Uh, failing typing the second semester I took it did not help that, so that was a <laughs> slight setback. Although I did, uh, in a class reunion, talked a little bit to the typing instructor and, instructor and later wrote him a letter thanking him again profusely for even though I was a uncoordinated typist that I learned how to type good enough to type my dissertation mm -hmm. articles, uh, you know, all kinds of things. So. I don't regret taking that class, but uh, I got in the top, upper 20% of the class. I had a, uh, the offer of a scholarship to Millikan University in Bloomington, Illinois in music and voice. Mm. Uh, but my father went to the University of Illinois, I was going to go to the University of Illinois, sure. and so forth. So. I really, there was no real debate about that. Mm -hmm. uh, the debatable part came from when I, I had gone to the University of Illinois with my father. We'd gone to football games. Mm -hmm. uh, he was part of the Illinois Crop uh, Improvement Association at the University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. All hybrid seed corn producers were. Uh, he also produced hybrid oats. And, clover and uh, a bunch of other stuff, but it was primarily hybrid seed. So I'd been to the university and I'd met people over there who were professors in the ag department. But when I wound up over there and got into the university, there were 30,000 students. Mm -hmm. And me from a town of 1,350. That's a lot of people. It was overwhelming. And 
I almost flunked out. Almost flunked out. <laughs> um, I was, they all, they evaluated everybody the, with your SATs and well, I guess just SATs and your high school performance and so forth. Mm -hmm. But it's trite, but it happened to me. We got in this big auditorium, a huge auditorium. Mm -hmm. And uh, I guess, I don't know if, is it, probably the university president at the time, but he said, look at the guy on your, the person on your right and the person on your left. By the end of two years, only one of you will be left. Mm -hmm. And he was right. Because the University of Illinois had to take all these students from Illinois. Right. But man, they weeded you out. English 101, phew, that got rid of an awful lot of them. Yeah. Uh, that, you know, there were certain, you had to take two years of basic classes. Right. And certain classes were intended to weed you out. Yeah. Because they couldn't handle all these students. Too many of them. There were, there were just too many. So I was fortunate that not only had I had a mother who had taught me to read before I ever got into school uh, and read a lot herself, but I had a very good high school teacher the last year, M Miss, Miss Swinford. And she knew that some of us were going to try to go on to into higher education, mm -hmm. and she really laid it to us. She would stop us and correct us in the hall in recess or mm -hmm. be between classes or mm -hmm. whatever. Um, she was she was quite she was quite an old maid. She was pretty comely. I comely is probably the best word to use. Uh, but man, she she really helped helped us a lot. Mm -hmm. um, one of um, one of my classmates, David Kindred, went on to become a sports writer for the Atlanta Constitution. Oh wow! Has written several books. Has uh, a short story about I think it's about baseball. It's about something in sports. Mm -hmm. And uh, best short stories of several years ago that they. You could buy it Barnes and Noble. Mm -hmm. Another uh, went into the ministry mm -hmm. at uh, Drake University. Wow! Became an ordained minister. Another John Houghton, that was Tom Shevlet. John Houghton uh, went on in chemistry and works for Dow Chemical Company. Uh, this is uh, this is pretty striking for a class of twenty-seven students. Yeah. Uh, like four or five PhDs out of this class and yeah. you know. so we had, we had some very good students I noted in what you sent me the you know what was your high school experience like and teachers that you appreciated uh, we had before Miss Swinford we had another Miss Br Mrs. Brack and she was also very good English literature etc so between the two of those we were in pretty good shape mm -hmm. uh, and we had a marvelous history professor, mm -hmm. Phil McCullough. Phil McCullough had been there forever. Mm -hmm. He also sold insurance on the side. Uh, but Phil taught us, besides history, he taught us civics. Mm -hmm. He also, before we were in contact with us, he was a, a coach <laughs> for a while. <laughs> uh, small school, you do a lot of things. Sure. <laughs> but Phil McCullough was, we, I mean, I went back to our 50th, 50th class reunion and people were still, still talking about what a good teacher Phil McCullough was. Wow. Even though the State Board of Education sent some hot shot to check out all the, the teachers Atlanta High School mm -hmm. and gave him a horrible evaluation. Really? Oh yeah. That's because the evaluators are sometimes not not all that great. Sure. Sometimes they are, but sometimes uh, they're not. They, they really they really missed the boat with him because I can still and 
my classmates can still remember things that he taught us in high school. All wars are fought for economic gain. Mm -hmm. Beware of someone, a politician who wraps himself in the flag. Mm -hmm. uh, th things like that. And his, the curious, as I figured out later in life, I didn't try to emulate it, techni technique of teaching was he would bore us to tears in civics class. <laughs> Just bore us to tears. You know, we're all sitting there trying to stay awake. Right. And he said, oh, by the way, uh, how's the federal government get new money into circulation? <laughs> uh, what's going on here? Why, what are you saying? Um, and he taught us how to use a proper table setting. He was in charge of the promenade at the prom mm -hmm. to show us how to walk with the young lady or with the young gentleman. Uh, <laughs> it was, he, he had a, a, a tremendous impact. As a matter of fact, when I was in high school, you know, I thought, you know, I'd like to be a history teacher like him. Sure. And I've always, I've always had a love for history uh, implanted by Phil McCullough. Mm -hmm. there's, there's just no doubt about it. And so when I eventually wound up in archaeology, the archaeology I've been interested in not only has a strong anthropological component, mm -hmm. there's also a strong historical component. Mm -hmm. To some extent I think of archaeology as trying to write about the history of unwritten history of the past mm -hmm. kind of thing about you know cultures that did not leave a written record mm -hmm. and we try to do our best to understand them mm -hmm. <laughs> so that was I played two years of baseball quit because I had a conflict with the <laughs> coach mm -hmm. but I was never a good baseball player <laughs> I played four years of high school basketball. Mm -hmm. I was not a good basketball player. <laughs> I sat on the bench most of the time while our team went 29-1 and one and and almost made it to the state tournament finals. That's impressive. So I excused myself to some extent thinking, well, if I'd gotten into an, a normal high school in central Illinois, I probably would have played a lot of basketball, mm -hmm. but with you know the actually the the first six people on that team they were just they were just tremendous yeah uh, we went down and we went down and beat Lincoln Illinois which is 15,000 people mm -hmm. and they had to give the team uh, a, uh, a police escort out of the building <laughs> oh. to keep them from being attacked yeah yeah <laughs> was uh, that embarrassing they threw yeah. stuff at the bus Gee. so I, I enjoyed I enjoyed playing basketball so much mm -hmm. that I always played and I played pickup up until two or three years ago mm -hmm. when I got to UNCG I organized a faculty basketball league oh yeah oh yeah mm -hmm. and we played anthropology and sociology had a team chemistry and physics I think had a team of course, the problem was PE always beat us. Sure. <laughs> but Cheryl, Lo Cheryl Logan, mm -hmm. one of the uh, people who played on, uh, I, I don't. She was in psychology. I think she played on the psychology team. So it was, it was mixed. I, the, I don't remember right offhand another female who played with us. But we had we had a great time for quite a while doing that. And I played. Um, on other leagues here at UNCG, mm -hmm. um, well, and if I could have, I'd been back in the Y, shooting baskets and looking for a pickup game this past fall, but wasn't wasn't going to happen. Sure. But that's you know it's something I've often thought the love of sports, even if you don't play good. Mm -hmm. You just you learn to love a sport because you play it, mm -hmm. and you love to play it. Yeah. And I still do calisthenics, calisthenics that I learned 
in high school, mm -hmm. I get up and do 90 push-ups. I'm 76 years old. Mm. Uh, mm. Yeah. Mm. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Uh, I do all. I do all kinds of. I do about an. I'm doing about an hour and a half of exercise every morning. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Just keeping active. Yeah. So, yeah. So I, I attribute the fact that I can still do archaeology in the field. I was just on site survey and excavating with my son in Louisiana last week. Yeah. Um, because. I take care of myself, but I, I exercise, I walk, and I do. Because if I didn't, I wouldn't be able to do archaeology, mm -hmm. and that would be a catastrophe for me. Right. But so, uh, that's pretty much the situation, the situation in high school. Okay. Uh, all the time that I was doing this, I was building up a collection of Indian artifacts with my grandfather. Mm -hmm. And for the, it may have been the 40th reunion, 50th, I, don't, I forget what class reunion it was. Sure. But I, uh, I had all the artifacts at UNCG and I would use them for teaching. Okay. But I, put them all in glass cases, I identified everything, put dates with them, mm -hmm. and took back almost 800 artifacts and gave them to the museum in my hometown. Wow. So they That's have lovely. that collection and I had inherited stuff from my grandfather as well. Mm -hmm. And so that was what should, should have happened. I couldn't keep telling people, you really ought to give this stuff to a museum yeah. if I didn't do it myself. Sure. And I'd always plan to. But when I saw the writing on the wall that I wasn't going to be using it for teaching anymore, up here at least, um, that, that sort of solidified that decision. The, um, I was trying to think of the movie about the high school kids that go away to college and so forth. Why can I think of the name of that film now? Which film? Because there's a oh, it's way back. Okay. Way back before, way back, back before you. Yeah. I'll, I'll think of it eventually. Okay. But uh, I always, I when I've seen that film, I I've thought of my high school, and the decision that people had to make, mm -hmm. the decision of going away to a university like the University of Illinois, which was overwhelming, and some went other places, mm -hmm. uh, or the decision to stay at home, where your friends were, where your relatives were, where everything, American graffiti, mm. <laughs> the American graffiti effect. Yeah. Uh, it's really, for small town America, American graffiti hit it right on the, hit it right on the nose. Yeah. Uh, we had mm -hmm. guys who went out and drag raced their cars and you know, all, all this stuff in America. Mm -hmm. But uh, to be, to do something else in life, the staying in small town rural Illinois was a trap in retrospect to be avoided if possible. <laughs> and uh, you know, some, some people didn't make it in the university. I had a, a cousin who did not, he, he got really sick his sophomore year and he got into engineering. He did, had no business in engineering, uh, but then he had to go home and work on the family farm. Mm -hmm. and, and I'm sure that he loved that life. Sure. It is a lovely life. Mm -hmm. It's a lovely life. But uh, it's not a very adventuresome life and I've always had a kind of wild streak in me mm -hmm. to go off and do crazy things. Somewhat crazy. All archaeologists are crazy, by the way. I'm okay. jumping ahead, but they're all crazy. <laughs> nobody does this kind of, nobody plays around with somebody else's 800 year old trash and <laughs> is all that sane. Uh, so you wanna, you wanna tackle the University of Illinois? Yeah. University of Illinois. Well, I didn't flunk out. That's good. I didn't flunk out. Uh, I darn near did the first semester, but I raised my grade point average over uh, over a point. 
Ooh. from the first semester to the second semester. Okay. Because I was in a fraternity, Psi Upsilon, it's my father's fraternity, mm -hmm. I was a legacy. Sure. And we had a, we had an academic advisor. He was a graduate student mm -hmm. and he was made an honorary brother of the house. Uh, also, he was Jewish. Yeah. Um, I say a lot of things about fraternities, but a lot of it's stereotypical. Sure. My fraternity was not all that stereotypical. Okay. They were fun, you know, some of the same things, but um, we were pretty open to people who were going to join. Mm -hmm. No no females joined fraternities back then. Right. Um, blacks were not in fraternities of there were not, you know, there were black fraternities, there were white fraternities, mm -hmm. and so forth, in the land of Lincoln, mm -hmm. which reminds me of lots of, when I was growing up in, in my hometown, mm -hmm. uh, my, my, one of my grandmother's sisters, because there were nine females and no males, one of my grandmother's sisters, mm -hmm. she had a house on the Underground Railroad. Oh, really? Yeah, and I'd go visit her at her house. Play her piano. Mm -hmm. I come on. Where'd the railroad come in? <laughs> I, I can't, <laughs> nobody ever explained this to me. Oh, gee, well, I, I can't see any railroad now. No. <laughs> but it, back to the advisor and the academic advisor. Mm -hmm. He gave us some very, very good advice, and I am still passing his advice on to my students, and they don't pay any attention to me at all. Most of them don't. Yeah. Maybe occasionally they do. But I went on to come out in, in the end with like a B plus average overall. Okay. Uh, so it worked. It yeah. worked for me. And I've one of the, one of the things I won't belabor the point is to organize, take really good notes, and organize your notes even rewrite your notes, but organize your notes so that you can go through your notes one last time the night before the exam. Mm -hmm. You go through your notes one last time before the exam the next day, then you shut your notes up and you go to your exam. Mm -hmm. You do not open a notebook or anything the day of the exam. Mm. Uh, but one time, let me see, we, we, we took five courses. Mm -hmm. At one time I had five finals back to back. Oh wow. You couldn't get out of it then. Right. Now, you got five five back to back, that's yeah. your problem. Yeah. And so I studied all of my subjects, mm -hmm. shut up the notebooks, and started taking finals back to back. Wow. I went into my geology final other students were lying around there on the floor in front of the Room mm -hmm. with their bu books and their notebooks, yeah. and they're all. And I'm, you know, I'm, you know, oh, aren't you worried? Aren't you? No, I, I studied. I studied last night, mm -hmm. or till actually it was about two days before. Yeah. And I went in and aced the final. Wow. But you know, he, he really was very, very good, and I try to pass that. I've always tried to pass that on to my students. Uh, I, and I hope some of them had taken some of the advice and it's, hel and it's helped them out. University of Illinois, uh, I, was, I had to take two, two semesters of general courses. Mm -hmm. I took history, of course. Uh, I took English. Mm -hmm. I did pretty good in English thanks mm -hmm. to those two professors. Right. Um, I took geology because I thought I might want to follow in the footsteps from my father. Reasonable. And I just loved to go in the lab and study different minerals and so forth. Historical geology, I aced that course. I thought it was fantastic. And I had a guy from Italy who taught it with a very pronounced accent. Uh, I also took human physiology. Uh, where they showed childbirth in one of the films, and people were vomiting in the class. <laughs> <laughs> the University of Illinois got all of these. We 
country bumpkins yeah. in there. <laughs> and you know, it was a trial by fire. Mm -hmm. Uh, they were going to give us, they were going to open our eyes to all kinds of different things. Mm -hmm. uh, it was really freedom of expression. And uh, this is the way a lot of the classes went. I took geography, it was a wonderful class in Latin American geography. Mm -hmm. But I gravitated into anthropology. Mm -hmm. But and I won't spend the next half hour on this, but I'll tell you about this anyway. Uh, the first class that I had was with John McGregor, mm -hmm. southwestern archaeologist who'd done some archaeology in Illinois. He dug up one house. Okay. <laughs> uh, he used A. L. Krober's anthropology textbook, brought into class yellowed, crackling old notes. Mm -hmm. We had a class of, I think this, the auditorium sat like 320 people. Okay. Uh, he taught, it was a two semester sequence, so he taught the archaeology and physical, and then the second semester it was like ethno ethnography, cultural anthropology, social anthropology. Okay. What a boring class. Mm. What a, I mean, I was interested in the subject matter, yeah. and I was bored to tears. Mm. I can imagine the people who were just in there because, you know, well, I look nice to me, and you know, mm. I'll take this. Mm -hmm. uh, I later took Midwestern archaeology from him, and I took uh, Southwestern archaeology, and his Southwestern class was very, very good. Mm -hmm. But that, that class, you know, that class was enough to make me think, I'll, I'll go with geology, yeah. or history, or something else. Mm -hmm. The second class that I got into, the second semester, was taught by Morris Siegel, Columbia University, uh, freshly minted PhD, although he was probably in his middle to late 30s mm -hmm. at that time. Sure. Uh, and I mention this because it's worth getting it on the record. Morris Siegel came into the class the first day there are like 300 and some of us in the class it's mm -hmm. a conch shell shaped thing yeah and all you know big stage down there in the lectern and he said uh, my name is Morris Siegel uh, I'm here to teach this course in cultural anthropology the text is going to be A.E. Hobel's anthropology text introduction to anthropology text which is relatively simple straightforward text good mm -hmm. text You'll have to write a paper. You'll have to take quizzes, uh, or you'll have discussion sections or quiz. They're principally on the paper because we've got teaching assistants. They're going to grade the papers. Mm -hmm. They will also give you quizzes on the chapters on Hobel. I will not test you on anything that I say in this class. Hmm. You do not have to come to class. You can not come to another class and still make an A in this class. Hmm. Your grade will be based solely on exams on the Hobel textbook and the one paper that you're going to write. Mm -hmm. I'm going to talk about sex, religion, and politics <laughs> in the anthropological perspective. Hmm. I, only, I only require that if you want to make a comment or ask a question, that you stand up, state your name, and make your comment or ask your question. And then we'll have a debate mm -hmm. about whatever you bring up. <clears throat> well, that's what he talked about. Okay. Sex, religion, and politics. Okay. And I can still remember some of the things that he talked about in yeah. the class. Mainly the sex and religion stuff. Sure. Uh, but he said, there's only one thing you can't ask me about, and that's what these little pills are that I pop in my mouth mm -hmm. while I'm up here lecturing. Mm -hmm. Well, of course, the students didn't believe him right at first. Right. So like the next, there's Monday, Wednesday, Friday. So like Wednesday, mm -hmm. you know, most everybody was there. Friday, most everybody was there. But then they started to drop off. Right. Uh, I might have missed three classes during the semester. Sure. But I was there 
most of the time, and I was in competition with uh, Bill Isabel, who became an approving archaeologist, trying to get the higher grade of, between the two of us in the <laughs> class. <laughs> but it was fascinating because he would challenge our Midwestern ideas, values, orientations, and so forth. Mm -hmm. And uh, students would stand up and say, you know, I'm Maggie Smith from Alt Alton, Illinois, and I don't think that what you have said about so-and-so or such-and-such -such is correct. And then he'd say, well, you know, why is that, Maggie? And, well, you know, it's sort uh, of... And he would absolutely demolish her argument. <laughs> Just demolish it. Students would cry. Wow. They would throw down their textbooks on the floor and stomp out of the class. <laughs> And I thought, you know, gee, this anthropology must be worth something. <laughs> They're not doing that in geology. <laughs> uh, and he told he told the story about how in his dissertation research he was working with a cattle herding group. And he wasn't getting anywhere. Back then it was typical that you had to spend at least a year in the field mm -hmm. in ethnography to see the ritual cycle of the whole year. Well, he'd been there, you know, a few weeks, maybe a month, and wasn't getting anywhere. And so he asked somebody he'd managed to befriend and, and the society, says, what's wrong? And the guy said, well, you're not married. <laughs> he said, every, every eligible male in our society is married. Mm. So you're really, we don't know what to make of you. You're, you know, like this oddball thing. Mm. And so he said, well... I guess I'll get married. So he got married. <laughs> According to their local rituals, traditions, and so forth. Hmm. And uh, she had a dowry that came along from her family, and mm -hmm. the dowry was some cattle. Okay. So he was there about a year and a half, and he, he built up his herd. <laughs> <laughs> he was really successful at cattle herding. Yeah. <laughs> But he had to go back to Columbia to write his this dissertation and get his degree. Well, he explained to us, he said, you know, General Real, but what am I going to do here? How am I going to break this to the woman I've been living with for a year or so? And well, you know, I think we probably ought to all get together and discuss this. So he had a meeting with her family. Mm -hmm. And he said, you know, I came from another place and I have to go back and report what I've been doing and all the rest of this, and so I'm going to be gone for a long time. I'm not sure when I'm going to, if, when or if I'm going to be back. Mm -hmm. And he said, they all listened to him, listened to him. Well, the real. And after he finished, they said, her family said, what's going to happen to the cattle? <laughs> that was their concern. That was that was their concern. He said, oh, well, the cattle stay with you. Oh, well, then that, that's not a problem. <laughs> that's not a problem. Right. Uh, I suppose they thought, you know, they could marry her off again because right. they'd have plenty of dowry to right. do it. Right. But I use that as an example of how he pushed the envelope, with, in this case, with provincial, traditional, young, Midwestern women mm -hmm. who, I'm, I swear, they left that class and they were all saying, you know, how could he do this? How could he leave that woman? You know, mm -hmm. you know oh, these anthropologists, they're really rotten people, aren't they? <laughs> <laughs> So, uh, so that that really is is what made me gravitate toward anthropo an anthropology degree, mm -hmm. um, and I had let's see, history and geology I think as minors, but I also uh, you know I took lots of courses in the anthropology department. Mm -hmm. Most of my teachers w were extremely neurotic. Uh, the guy who taught me linguistics was so nervous when he taught linguistics he had to put his hand on his other hand to hold the chalk on the board to get started writing. Oh, wow. Yep. Yeah. Uh, it was cutthroat. Mm -hmm. The full professors had parties, didn't invite the associates. The associates had parties, didn't invite the assistant. Uh, backbiting, backstabbing, uh, but brilliant people. Mm -hmm. I mean, they were brilliant people. Uh, not everybody was like that. Mm -hmm. But uh, I took I took a class with Oscar Lewis, mm. children of Sanchez. Oh wow! One of the children of Sanchez was a maid in his house at the University of Illinois. Huh. 
after class was over he'd ask me to stay after class and he'd go to his piano because he was taking voice lessons at the time sure and I was singing bass in the University of Illinois concert choir mm -hmm. and Lewis would want to see which one of us could that particular night hit the lowest note on his <laughs> piano sure uh, he he invited me to go with him to do the study in Puerto Rico that produced uh, La, La Vida. Mm -hmm. uh, and my father would not let me go because he needed me to work in the fields, mm -hmm. the farm fields over the summer. What a stupid decision. <laughs> uh, and I had Don Lathrop, became a famous South American archaeologist. Elaine Bloom, was another, she was, she's be the best field archaeologist I ever worked with. A uh, wonderful, wonderful field archaeologist, really a wonderful person, but very neurotic. Mm. She, she's just neurotic because of the, the situation there. Uh, things that made an impact on me at the University of Illinois was I had a horrible time. It was cutthroat on the student end, mm -hmm. too. Uh, you had to work I, I went on five hours of sleep average. Wow, yeah. Uh, at least for the first two years, probably got up to six hours a night average by the time I was a senior. Mm -hmm. uh, it was not fun. If it was fun, you flunked out. Sure. Or you were brilliant. Mm -hmm. I was not brilliant, <laughs> but I sure could work hard. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I made up for my lack of whatever I lacked by just working myself to death. Mm -hmm. I mean, I came, I came back over, Chris, or over the Thanksgiving vacation and read my entire textbook for a history class on medieval history. Wow. I mean, the, you, the entire the one, kind, yeah. the kinds of That's the kinds of thing you did. Uh, so the academics I certainly learned things, mm -hmm. and I learned things way apart from anthropology and archaeology as well as some anthropology and archaeology. But what I interject, if, if the guys in the fraternity wanted to go to the Rose Bowl in California, mm -hmm. I stayed back and studied, mm -hmm. uh, that kind of thing. Uh, but what made it pleasurable for me was the University of Illinois Concert Choir. Okay. So did you join that um, when you first got in? When I first got in, when I first got a, uh, to the, I'd sung in, in high school in, in chorus and mm -hmm. also in quartet. Mm -hmm. Sang two years in quartet touring Central Illinois my first two years in the university and over the summer until the tenor got sick, or no, he was uh, the lead got sick. Uh, but I love the music. I love the people in music. I still love the people in music. Uh, people in music are very special people. Mm -hmm. uh, they're not neurotic. No. Uh, they're also very bright. Um, here at UNCG, the higher SAT scores come from people in music. Uh, they're yeah. Uh, so my best friends, even in the fraternity, were in music. Mm -hmm. And outside of the fraternity were in music. And we toured around the state of Illinois. And my senior year, actually the summer of my senior year after I graduated, we went on the first European tour of the co concert choir at the University of Illinois. Oh, wow. And we went to Germany and France and England. And Switzerland, Italy, and we sang in the train station in Paris, and we sang in St. Mark's Cathedral in Italy. And, uh, if, if I had not had the musical stuff, the university experience would have been just drudgery. And, you know. So that's what, that's what I remember fondly. Mm -hmm. Of, of the universe of undergraduate work. Well, 
I was accepted into the graduate program at University of Illinois. Mm -hmm. I went into the, I graduated, I went into the field with Elaine Bloom, mm -hmm. and there were one, two, three, four, un, four like undergrad types, mm -hmm. a graduate assistant, and the professor Elaine Bloom, who was at, worked all the time in Illinois archaeologists. Archaeology st started our work in the Southwest. We worked in Rock Island, Illinois primarily, although we also worked along the Illinois River. Uh, I learned a tremendous amount of field archaeology from Elaine Bloom Harold. Harold because she married the guy at the museum in Davenport, Illinois, hmm. uh, eventually. But uh, that really, more than anything, I think, solidif solidified more my interest in, in pursuing archaeology. Uh, but I'll tell you, one of the guys who was on the project, who was a sophomore at the University of Illinois at the time, was Don Johansson mm. of Lucy fame. Really? Yeah. And we, we would sit around in our very little free time, because she occupied her time off, our very little free time at night, after we labeled, moisture labeled material, we'd sit around in the common area and... Uh, <laughs> talk about, you know, well, what are you going to do? Well, I was going to go, what I wanted to do was go into French Paleolithic archaeology. Mm -hmm. I'd studied French. I could speak French. I was going to France. I'd boned up on French. That was what I was going to do. Mm -hmm. Well, what are you going to do, John? Uh, Don. Well, well, you know, uh, I'm going to, when I finish here at University of Illinois, I'm going to go up to University University of Chicago, and I'm going to study with Clark Cowell, and I'm going to go to Africa, and I'm going to find the earliest ancestor of the human line. Mm -hmm. <laughs> oh, yeah, Don. Oh, sure, Don. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, Don, we know. And he's sure. That's what he did. I mean, yeah. he made tremendous contributions, mm -hmm. and we still correspond some. He came here to give a talk one time, mm -hmm. and we got together to reminisce. And I have a wonderful photo of the two of us working at the site of the John Deere, first John Deere Ironworks in Rock Island, Illinois, where Elaine had gone off someplace for the day, and so for fun, I, we had a big link chain and I wrapped it around myself and I wrapped it around Don and we're there in the excavation like we're <laughs> slaves and somebody took our picture. And I gave that to him uh, a while back. But So um, that was that was my orientation but I didn't I was not convinced that I wanted to go I wanted to continue on at the University of Illinois. I just didn't think I could stand all these neurotic professors. Okay. Uh, and I you know I mean, academically, I, I needed a change, but I was reading a book by the top theorist, mm -hmm. Walt Taylor, mm -hmm. that bounced around the back of Elaine's brown station wagon when we went back and forth to the field, and I'd read Taylor's book. thought it was wonderful. And so Elaine said near the end of the, she said, well, she said two things to me. She said, Joe, you got to decide. Because she knew I was going to Europe mm. for the tour. You got to decide where you're going to dedicate your life to singing, or you're going to dedicate your life to archaeology. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and uh, but she said, you know, what you ought to think of doing is going to Southern Illinois University, where Walt Taylor is. Mm -hmm. uh, and so when I got back from the tour, I went down to Carbondale, Illinois, and I got an interview with the then head of the department, Walt Taylor and said, you know, I've been doing this. I'm interested in French Paleolithic archaeology. I just came back from France. I spoke French with everybody, you know, taxi drivers and waiters and whoever I could get a hold of. Mm -hmm. uh, he said, well, I've got a friend from Harvard, because he graduated from Harvard, Hal Movius. He's digging in uh, southern France, Abbey, Abbey Patard, I think it was, over the summer, and I think he might need an assistant. Mm -hmm. So he sort of dangled that out in front of me. Right. And uh, 
Oh, well. Uh, he said, we could let you in the program here, but we didn't have to let you in on probation because you just got a B-plus average, you know, slightly B-plus average. I said, you know, the valedictorian of our class, you know, 15,000 or 1,500 graduates didn't have a 4.0. Mm -hmm. It was 5.0, well, I think, for us. And I, but it, I, okay, okay. So I let them know back at University of Illinois I wasn't going to show up. Mm -hmm. I was going to go to Southern. Yeah. This would never, ever happen today, obviously. Yeah. Uh, that was the weirdest, oddest thing. I had no place to live. I had no job. I, okay, I'll go. <laughs> and so I went down there and uh, started out. Uh, I was lucky that J. Charles Kelly, who wound up being my dissertation advisor, uh, gave me a job like, they were on the quarter system, so like middle, middle of the second quarter, mm -hmm. I had like 80 bucks left in my bank account, mm -hmm. and I was gonna, I was gonna have to leave. And I talked to him about the situation. He said, "Well, you go. I can give you a job in the museum, preparing exhibits." Mm -hmm. So he did, and he saved my hide. Yeah. Um, but about the same time, Walt Taylor called me into his office, and he said. Uh, I got a letter from Hal Mobius, and Mobius said, yeah, I need an assistant. Go with me to dig in France over the summer, but, you know, you've only been here a couple of quarters. We're going to recommend Burley Clay because he's been here over a year. Mm -hmm. so he was a previous Same. year crop. Mm -hmm. I thought, well, well that's, that's why I came here. Mm -hmm. I came here to go work in France. I mean, you said you were going to do this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But I'll tell you what I'll do. I'm going to Zacatecas, Mexico over the summer. And uh, I can give you uh, an assistantship on my project down there. Well, that was on a Monday, and I said, well, uh, give me till Friday. Mm -hmm. Let me think this over. Sure. So I was sort of in shock. I knew about three words in Spanish, like hello and goodbye and water I think but I went around and I asked the other graduate students I asked Burley Clay I said Burley Taylor says you're gonna go to France mm -hmm. uh, that's what I wanted to do uh, he said oh yeah he offered he offered the Zacatecas thing to me but I wouldn't go with him I asked Phil Wagon Phil Wagon says, oh, the reputation he's got in the field I wasn't about to go with him to Zacatecas so like Several guys had turned him down. Huh. So Burley had turned him down and he sent Burley to France. Yeah. I was stuck because mm -hmm. I didn't have any alternative. Right. So I said, okay, I'll, uh, I'll go. I'll go. I bought two textbooks in Spanish. University of Chicago textbook was the best. Uh, I bought Oscar Lewis's Children of Sanchez, mm -hmm. which I had not read as an undergrad, but I knew about. Mm -hmm. I bought that, to bone up on Mexican culture, mm -hmm. and went down to Santa Fe and then went down to Zacatecas, Mexico, and spent the summer in Zacatecas, Mexico with oh. Taylor. Okay. This what was an experience that is engraved in my memory like being chipped in stone or burned with a brand mm -hmm. or whatever. It was like I could not have had a more vivid experience if they'd taken me to Mars. Mm -hmm. Probably would have been less vivid mm -hmm. in Mars. Sure. But he was the leading person in archaeological theory of his day. He wrote his dissertation, wrote it up his dissertation for publication in 1948 uh, in a memoir of the American Anthropological Society, number 69. Uh, but he was not, well let me cut to the chase, sort of like a basket case in the field. Mm. Great in theory, but he couldn't apply the theory that I, I'd read his book three times. And I'm thinking, well, I read all this stuff here. Well, where is it in the, you know, mm -hmm. he's not putting it into practice. Well, probably this spring, 
the journal Ancient Mesoamerica, which is the primary English language journal for Me Mesoamerican archaeology, mm -hmm. will publish my article on my summer with Taylor gotcha. in 1964 mm -hmm. on the record about Walt Taylor, mm -hmm. a personal account. Okay. And it lays it all out. Gotcha. So, finally. Mm -hmm. uh, but that's what set me off in, in Mexican archaeology. So I. But uh, he had not. He had chosen the, uh, a guy already had his masters who was on the project. He was going to try to get him to use our field data as a PhD dissertation. And uh, that didn't work out. First of all, the guy didn't want to do it. Mm -hmm. I would have done it. Maybe. He didn't want to do it. And then the guys who were washing up the material in Santa Fe stole all the projectile points. Oh. And without the... I projectile points are the thing that identify the culture, so to speak. Right. We got the points back, but they're out of context, and so it just absolutely demolished the use of the material. It was never published. Mm. So, since I'd gone to, with Taylor to Mexico, by the time the summer was over, and he had to leave to, for the opening of the Museum of Anthropology in Mexico City, mm -hmm. that famous museum, right. and left us all in camp, he uh, designated me to go with the cook to buy the groceries because I could speak more Spanish mm. than the the other guy that was there. Uh, I really took a liking to virtually all aspects of Mexican culture. Uh, I was fascinated reading Children of Sanchez and seeing Children of Sanchez in front of me, for mm -hmm. heaven's sakes. Sure. Uh, all of this stuff was just absolutely fascinating to me, and I'd go into town every weekend, make friends, take in three by five cards with vocabulary, mm -hmm. worked as best I could, dated local girls. Mexican women are beautiful. Mm -hmm. I married one of them. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, when I got back to Southern Illinois, they had a very lively program in archaeology in Mexico. So, well, you know, he's gone to Mexico. So, you know, you, you want to go down to my project in Puebla? You want to go to my project in the Chinampas and Terraces in the Valley of Mexico? Mm -hmm. um, I went back to Mexico three times in one year. Wow. Driving. Yeah. Uh, and uh, I took a class from J. Charles Kelly in which I wrote a paper on the origin of West Mexican metal, metallurgy, mm -hmm. which comes in more or less about 900 AD and the possibility that it came from South America along the Pacific coast. And through that paper, Kelly got me interested in doing archaeology on the coast mm -hmm. because he was doing archaeology adjacently in the highlands. Mm -hmm. And he wanted more information on the coast. Sure. And so I wound up in the southern coast of, south central coast of Nayarit, Mexico, 15 years or 15 months in Mexico, uh, getting the material for my dissertation with a. I think it was a $5,400 grant from the National Science Foundation plus a university assistantship that I stretched into 15 months of work. Wow. Paying yeah. one or two workers, buying gasoline, 16 tires for the uni university truck because <laughs> it just beat it to death. Uh, and, and it was on uh, cultural history and cultural contact. Uh, in the central coastal area of Nayarit it was essentially what it was, mm -hmm. and I finished that finished that dissertation. Well, let me, let me back up because I know you want to get to UNCG eventually. Uh, I was back. I went back to uh, Southern Illinois University in '68, mm -hmm. and was given, as were most people returning from the field. Uh, given a year uh, three-quarter time teaching position. Okay. So I taught like three classes 
One was an extension for adult students mm -hmm. off campus. And uh, I, we were supposed to spend that year trying to figure out where, we're, where we were going to go. Mm -hmm. uh, for me, that stretched into 1969. Because it was back in 68, and I was there in the spring of 69. Mm -hmm. And we hit the big recession. Mm -hmm. The big recession was coming, looming on the horizon in 70. Gotcha. So I was looking at positions that were advertised like in December of 68. By January 69, they were taking them down off the board. Mm. Uh, so I was looking at several places, uh, looking at uh, Louisiana Baton Rouge, uh, University of Oklahoma, University of the Americas in Mexico, uh, and UNCG. Mm -hmm. Well, I was in Carbon, Illinois, wife and a very, very young daughter, um, worried about where I was going to get employed, and, and they invited me to come to Greensboro to interview. So they paid my plane trip. I came out here. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne Thompson was the head of the sociology anthropology department. Mm -hmm. Herrick Kupfer was the head of the program of anthropology at that particular time. Uh, they had brought in a girl from Colorado before me. And uh, there were several, I, I'm not sure exactly why they, they didn't want her or maybe they had to bring in two, you know, I don't, I don't know exactly what it was. Mm -hmm. But they brought me in and uh, I thought it was a really nice place. And they, they pulled some dirty tricks on me, at least one dirty trick. Uh, they had the faculty gathering at Bill Knox's house. Mm -hmm. Bill Knox, independently wealthy, that is like a 10 acre spread mm -hmm. out in the Oak Ridge area oh, okay. with the tennis court yeah. and a horse. And, uh, and he's an assistant professor in sociology. I thought, boy, they really make out here. <laughs> Gee whiz. You know, I'm, I'm only teaching three quarters at Southern Illinois University. Man, this looks like a good deal to me. Mm -hmm. Well, I didn't know the other, the other side of the story, mm -hmm. the rest of the story. Uh, so I gave my talk on my dis. <laughs> I almost talked about linguistics, mm -hmm. uh, nonverbal communication in Mexico, because I was so sick and tired of working on my dissertation, because I hadn't finished it. I was ABD. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad I didn't, because they weren't hiring a linguist or hiring an archaeologist. Right. So, I talked about what I'd done for my dissertation research, and uh, one of the fat, one of the people on the faculty took me here to the alumni house upstairs where mm -hmm. they put me up, and we parked outside. And he said to me, he "said You know, you say you're gonna, you think you're gonna be able to finish your dissertation um, by the spring." Uh, you know, how, how realistic is that? Mm -hmm. I said, well, you know, I've, I'm writing five pages a day. That's my goal. Mm -hmm. I'm, or I'm doing five pages a day. Mm -hmm. At the rate I'm going, I think I'm pretty sure I can get it done by, by then. Mm -hmm. So he was not at all convinced. He was also ABD. Mm -hmm. uh, Wayne Thompson took me to the airport, mm -hmm. and he said, we want to hire you. Mm -hmm. Will you come here to UNCG? Mm -hmm. And I said, well, gee, and I didn't expect that. I was expecting to interview in a couple more places, like Oklahoma and Baton Rouge. Mm -hmm. and I said, well, you know, let, uh, we probably took me on a Sunday, and I said, you know, give me an give me until the end of the week. Mm -hmm. Well, I've got to go back. I've got to talk to my wife about this. Mm -hmm. See what she thinks about it. So I went back and talked to my wife, Amelia, 
And I said, you know, it's really a pretty place. It's not a big town, not a big city. Mm -hmm. uh, the people are really friendly. UNCG does not have a graduate program, doesn't even, you know, may not have had an undergraduate major in anthropology at that time. Mm -hmm. they, were, they, they were saying, they told me that they expected to have an MA in anthropology in five years. Mm -hmm. so they must have had a, a BA at that time. Uh, a, not, a good place to raise children. Uh, hills and trees and mm -hmm. green, you know. Sure. And so I thought, well, she said she thought, said it sounded good to her. So I called up Wayne probably on a Wednesday and said, yeah, I'll take it. Mm -hmm. I'll take it. By Friday, they had called me from Baton Rouge saying, will you come down here and interview? Mm -hmm. And I said, I can't. Mm -hmm. I, you, you all hadn't gotten hold of me. Mm -hmm. I needed a bird in a hand. Yeah. Uh, I told them I would go to UNCG. Mm -hmm. Um, the same thing happened with Oklahoma. They mm -hmm. said, you know, are you interested in coming out here? No, but I've got a friend who, he, he wound up with a job. Mm -hmm. So I came out here, the salary, the salary. Okay. $9,800 a year. Wow, okay. Yeah, $9,800 a year. And if I finished my dissertation, mm -hmm. it would automatically go up to ten thousand five hundred. Mm -hmm. This is nineteen sixty nine. Nineteen sixty nine. Yeah. And I finished uh, that year. Uh, it was seventy. So I, I probably published a couple things. I gave. Um, I gave a paper in a professional meeting. I had students to take to the University of the Americas for field work from UNCG mm -hmm. if they wanted to go uh, over the summer. Mm -hmm. and a couple of them did. Uh, teaching all these classes and so forth. Uh, I got a letter from my dissertation advisor in January saying that I'd completed all of the requirements for the PhD. And mm -hmm. with that, they gave me the 10-5. Mm. But they did not give me a raise for that year. They gave other mm. people in the department raises. Mm -hmm. And I went to the head, Wayne Thompson at the time, and said, Wayne, what, what's going on here? I got nothing. Mm -hmm. He said, well, you got 10-5. I mm -hmm. said, that was the contract. Right. It didn't have to do with my performance during the year here. Right. I, true, I finished the dissertation while I was here, but you know, when a when a colleague you know got eleven percent or whatever it was at the time, mm -hmm. quite a bit, and I got nothing, but I couldn't I couldn't shake it. Uh, and that you know, we're taking the the good and the bad along with this, and that's that's one thing that always stuck in my craw because I felt it was unfair. Mm -hmm. And one thing that I do not like is unfairness. And when I was head of the department, and when I had students in the field, or whenever I've been in a, in a position of some at least minor authority, uh, I've always tried to tried my best to be fair to people. Mm -hmm. But and so you can tell that's always stuck in my craw. But. That launched me on uh, on my time at UNCG, mm -hmm. and I was interested primarily in continuing in Mexico. And I I worked at the University of Americas in uh, Cholula, Puebla, for three summers and mm -hmm. took UNCG students with me. Mm -hmm. I mean, I had fifteen or so students from them as well, sure. doing archaeology there. But then they had a big strike there, uh, and I went on to. I moved. I wanted to move out into West Mexico, back to West Mexico. I went to West Mexico, uh, worked primarily then in the state of Jalisco, although I got a Fulbright to go to Nayarit mm -hmm. to do a follow-up on my dissertation work in 1983 with students from the Autonomous University of Guadalajara. Mm -hmm. uh, when I came here, oh gee, there I don't know how many 
how many students were here in 1969? 5,000? Yeah. Maybe? Maybe, and they had yeah. just they had just allowed uh, boys to enter. They had just allowed males to come here. Mm -hmm. And I always felt, though nobody ever told me this, that they were interested in me in part because of their idea that archaeology is a male pursuit. Mm. Males do it, so to get more males interested in what we offer here, mm -hmm. be nice to have archaeology. Mm -hmm. Well, you know, it was some of my at least early on, females who went on in archaeology. <laughs> uh, to graduate school in archaeology. Mm -hmm. One of them went to Southern Illinois University and wound up with a master's degree Aww. and beca uh, eventually became a dean. Very impressive. Uh, so, uh, I mean, but they were, they, were, they were fine people in the department, mm -hmm. sociology and anthropology. Uh, I really got along very well with the people in anthropo or in sociology, especially Bill Knox, uh, Dave Prato was a dear friend until his untimely death. Aunt Elaine Burgess, somewhat more cantankerous. Bill Noland, wonderful gentleman, Bill Noland. Gave us tickets. My wife and I gave us tickets. He was from Chapel Hill, graduating from Chapel Hill, and gave us tickets to go see a football game at Chapel Hill the first year that we were here. Mm. Um, oh, trying to think of some of the other people. There was an. Oh, I can't remember her name. I hadn't thought about her for for years. Uh, Ron McCurbin was here. At the time I came here, there was another fellow here who who left, and I can't I can't remember his name now. Uh, so there were people who were who were here who wound up. Mm -hmm. uh, Don Allen is another another fine member of the sociology department, and we had lots of we'd have picnics all of us together, and it was it was it was really nice. Mm -hmm. um, the Bob Miller was the dean. Bob Miller interviewed me. Is Bob still teaching? I don't know. I don't know. Uh, he's he's done incredible service to this university mm -hmm. in so many ways. Bonnie, his wife, his second wife, was a student of mine huh. in anthropology. Oh, well, that's nice. Yeah, and uh, but Bob was. I remember when Bob Miller interviewed me, Bob said, what's the likelihood that you will eventually become an authority in the area you have chosen to work, which is Western Mexico? Mm -hmm. I thought it was an interesting question. That's why I remember it. Yeah. And I said, well, I think there's a pretty good, there's a pretty good possibility <laughs> that I could become an authority in that field. Uh, the one thing that was in my favor was that very few people worked in that area. Sure. They weren't interested. They were working in Aztecs, Zapotecs, Oaxaca, the Maya. Mm -hmm. And so West Mexico is a field that was pretty open. Mm -hmm. And you knew pretty much everybody who was working mm -hmm. in that area. And there weren't very many. So I had that on my side. The other was my fascination for the archaeology out there and my determination to, to pursue that. Now, when I, you know, when I came here, I was work, instead of working in West Mexico, I was in Puebla in central Mexico. Mm -hmm. So I was already diverted from, you know, what he'd asked me about. But I can say with confidence that after 50 years of working in West Mexican archaeology, or more, more or less that, that if that was a goal that he hoped that I achieved, I think that I have achieved it. Mm -hmm. uh, there, there were 
basically three of us mm -hmm. <laughs> who made different contributions. One of my friends has died. The other, I was in a symposium honoring him in Mexico this fall. Uh, so it pretty well boiled down to the three old guys who dedicated their life to working in that area. Mm -hmm. So I, and I'm still, I'll be digging yeah. in February. So, uh, but at right. any rate. Uh, so Bob, I remember vividly that conversation I had with Bob Miller and Bob Miller was from Illinois. Mm -hmm. uh, he, he, we talked about the fact that he wrote up television programs for Watch Mr. Wizard. <laughs> Because Bob's a yeah, chemist, right? And so he invent all these things for the, and I think the broadcast out of Chicago. Yeah. Stan Jones was here. Stan Jones was also from from the University of Chicago. Yeah. And Stan Jones invited all of we knew hirees yeah. over to his house um, on West Market. A wonderful, warm guy. His wife was so gracious. Mm -hmm. You couldn't think of somebody inviting all of the new faculty to their house yeah. <laughs> anymore. But that's the kind of intimacy mm -hmm. that that was around at the time that I came here. Most of my students, of course, were girls, females. Mm -hmm. Most of the students were B students. Mm -hmm. You hardly ever got anybody down in the D or failing range. Mm -hmm. They had they had to get sick or something. You know. mm -hmm. uh, everybody came here, especially all the girls, came here from relatively privileged backgrounds. They were dedicated to doing well because they had always done well. Mm -hmm. uh, it was almost a hundred percent white. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm thinking of, uh, they had one black fellow on the faculty, Joe Himes. Joe Himes and his wife Estelle. Mm -hmm. uh, he was blind, a blind mm -hmm. professor from a chemistry accident when he was in a chem lab, I think when he was in high school. Huh. Uh, but, uh, you know, they were, they were wonderful people. Uh, but there weren't, the faculty was not very diverse. I mean, I mean, they were talking about getting men in here in the faculty. Right. Uh, the student body was not very diverse. Mm -hmm. When Nixon invaded Cambodia, the young ladies at UNCG had a sit-in, mm -hmm. a sit-down, a sit-down. It wasn't even a sit-in. It was a sit-down mm -hmm. over on a hill over here by the, one of the residential <laughs> dorms <laughs> in protest. <laughs> they, the, I mean, they managed to yeah. they managed to get that far. You know? Yeah. A, a sit-down. Yeah. Uh, you didn't have any problems with students in your class. You didn't have any problems with the parents of the students. Uh, so, it was, it was very different, <clears throat> very different then. The university was also extremely, extremely interested in research. Mm -hmm. It was extremely interested in research at that time, basically for two reasons. One, very few people did it. Mm -hmm. Because it was the woman's college. It was a teaching institution. Right. Lida Gordon Shivers in sociology. Lida Gordon was mm -hmm. one of the old faculty mm -hmm. members <coughs> from, the, from the days of yeah. the women's college. And part of the debate was, how do we evaluate, as we're shifting the paradigm of UNCG to a more research-oriented university, how do we evaluate the people who have been here for a long time, were hired in here just to teach? Mm -hmm. And that's what they've done. And some of them are very, very good, and some of them are maybe not so good. Mm -hmm. But how do we evaluate them when we're pushing this research stuff? So one of the nice things about being at UNCG in that atmosphere from my point of view was I wanted to do research. Mm -hmm. Not that I didn't want to do teaching. I've always aspired, as probably most of us, to be a, at least a good teacher mm -hmm. or a very good teacher. Mm -hmm. um, I never won any prizes for it here. I will say I went to, <laughs> went to Mexico 
to teaching the University of Guadalajara and won the Teaching Excellence Award <laughs> in Spanish. <laughs> so uh, there are strange things that happen in life. But <clears throat> I, always, I always tried my best. Sure. And probably made students suffer tremendously in some cases, um, applying the screws to them. But uh, I always had a very hefty interest in in the research component because it's it's my curiosity, my desire to know, mm -hmm. my desire to find out things that are new, to expand my knowledge in my little corner of the, the universe. And so UNCG was very accommodating. I mean, they man, the research council, psh, you're going to Mexico, you know, here's your airfare, here's mm -hmm. some money, to, you know, here's your travel expenses. Uh, they uh, they really, for many, many years, pressed anybody who wanted to do research, there were funds available to do what you wanted to do. Mm. One of the shifts in UNCG, from my perspective, of course I haven't, I'm trying to think of when I totally left here, mm -hmm. and it was probably about 2007 maybe, mm -hmm. 2007, 2008, it's around that time. Okay. Because I took phase retirement. So, you know, we're, we're talking about 10 years ago. I don't know what's happened in the last 10 years. Mm -hmm. But what I could see was a, a very pronounced shift toward, from academics to economics. Hmm. Before the administration, Stan Jones, Bob Miller, Bob Moran, uh, these people were interested in research for what it contributed to the academic environment of the university and advancing our knowledge of whatever the heck it might happen to be uh, in a wider perspective. Mm -hmm. But it became more and more get grants. Mm -hmm. Get grants and give us overhead. Mm -hmm. I calculated one time, and I won't give you the exact figures, but you can go calculate it if you want. The amount of the university budget for paper, Xerox, secretaries, etc., that was funded through faculty grants. And the faculty was then, and probably still is, paying a tremendous amount, a tremendous amount of the expense of running the darn university. Hmm. They're not paying the salary of the dean or the chancellor, or, but in terms of that kind of expense, mm -hmm. uh, I was just, I was just floored when I calculated it one year because they published the information in uh, like the local newspaper, and I said, "Hey, well, let me see. Well, wait, what's what's going on here?" Uh, I only say that I think it's unfortunate from my my own perspective. Mm -hmm. uh, they tended to get in people who were more well known for their grants than the contribution they made to their field. Mm -hmm. They assumed that if somebody was willing to give you a $500,000 grant for a three-year project in X, that that went through a process that automatically you, therefore, that sort of certified you as making great contributions to, their field, to your field. But that's not necessarily the case. Sure. Uh, look at history. Mm -hmm. Historian Bardolph was here. Mm -hmm. uh, I knew Bardolf went to his house. I didn't invite us over to eat. People like Bardolf made tremendous contributions without a National Science Foundation grant mm -hmm. or a grant from, you know, Housing and Urban Development or whatever. <laughs> uh, and and I I think they should have been able to at least work toward. Maybe they worked toward it and they weren't so successful sometimes um, giving out prizes and recognition and 
so forth. Uh, the so forth is jobs <laughs> <laughs> to, to to people based primarily on the money they could bring into the university. Mm -hmm. uh, before I left the university, I had a National Geographic project for the area where I'm where I'm actually built a house. That's where we live most of the year. Uh, they funded us three times. I stretched it into a five-year uh, deal, and I also got funding from another institute to work on a couple other sites. Mm -hmm. uh, it was probably sixty thousand, fifty thousand, sixty thousand uh, dollars over that five-year five-year period. The university gave me half salary, time off when I was doing the project, so I'm, I'm not complaining, I mean, they helped me. Sure. Uh, thank goodness for Tim Johnson, mm -hmm. he gave me the second one. Um, the, and Walter Beale gave me the first one, so mm -hmm. Walt, between Walt and, and Tim. Uh, but they could not get overhead from the National Geographic. National Geographic does not provide overhead. Oh. It all goes to you. Yeah. But the hassle, just the bureaucratic hassle of trying to do the project, running the money through UNCG, mm -hmm. I mean, by the time I was through, I, I mean, if I'd stayed here, I said, I, I'm, I'm never going to, I'm never going to write another, for another grant in my life. Mm -hmm. I just can't stand the red tape and the bureaucracy. I mean, I got the money. Uh, just give it to me. Mm -hmm. You know, I'll fill out forms on me. But I hope that they found out a way to reduce the bureaucracy and alleviate some of the burden on people who do get grants, mm -hmm. whether they get a hunk of them or not. Uh, it, it's it's tough for them to want you to get grants, and then when you get grants, they put you through all these hoops in order to be able to spend the money, right. which is not theirs anyway. I don't know, but anyway, that's a <laughs> so. So I worked here as an assistant professor. Then I became an associate professor, and then I became a full professor. Uh, clawed my way up the <laughs> ladder, uh, and. And became head of the anthropology department. I was head, I think, for eleven years. And it was a department at that point. It, it was a department at that point. When did it shift to becoming to out of sociology? Uh, it shifted out of sociology. I was very much in favor of that. Mm -hmm. I think, as was Ron McCurban. Um, I don't know if Tom Fitzgerald, and Bill Coleman were on board at that time or not. Probably were. Uh, Harriet Kupfer was the first head of the. Head of the anthropology department. Okay. Was Harriet Kupfer as head of the department, and uh, then after, I think it was right after Harriet, we brought in Louis. Uh, we brought in Mary Helms, and it may be after Mary Helms that I took over. I'm. My chronology of doing this because it was split up and mm -hmm. uh, is a little is a little bit vague. Okay. Uh, but when we started out as an anthropology department, we were known as a four field department. Okay. We had physical, archaeology, sociocultural, and linguistics. Okay. Those are the four basic fields. Mm -hmm. uh, our focus was on preparing students to go to graduate school okay. by giving them the kind of preparation we thought that would be useful to compete to get into a good graduate school mm -hmm. and I think we were very successful at doing that given the size of our program. Mm -hmm. uh, a, number of, a number of our people went on and became I don't know if anybody went on and became a great linguist but Sociocultural people and archaeologists and physical anthropologists. Oh yeah. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. Um, and every year they have a a ceremony at homecoming, 
and they give an award to the outstanding alumnus of our program mm -hmm. and what some of these people have done is is truly outstanding I don't know <laughs> I will say the last one who got the award this past fall was a student of mine in archaeology mm -hmm. and you have to be out like I think I, mean, I don't remember this five or ten years okay Dorothy Bruner handles that so she knows sure. all of that yeah uh, but a number a number of these the people who have gotten that award have been they've gotten it in archaeology mm -hmm. uh, so I was I was very pleased with that uh, what I was not pleased with is the fact that when I was hired in here they said that we would have a master's in anthropology in five years mm -hmm. and we never got a master's mm. and I put together with the help of some people in the department and without the help of some others um, but especially the help of Mary Kay Sanford who was a outstanding brilliant physical anthropologist who won the Teaching Excellence Award and the Research Excellence Award. Um, so there were people like Mary Kay in the department and uh, others who were sort of on the fence but would go along with it. Um, I tried to get when I like the second my second period in like second four-year term in anthropology I tried to get the the department to move toward a master's program mm -hmm. and uh, if there was one thing that I wish I had not failed in and probably have to take a fair amount of the credit for failing in it because I couldn't convince the faculty or the administration to go along and back it. Mm -hmm but I set up a program with Wake Forest University a combined master's program their the pref the size of their departments was about the department was about the same and what they did complicate complemented ours but did not uh, run in conflict with ours okay like Ned Wood all taught southeastern archaeology mm -hmm. well I taught southeastern archaeology but I was mainly teaching Mexican and Peruvian stuff mm -hmm. uh, they had a museum of anthropology mm -hmm. we didn't have a museum here right uh, we had a good program in physical anthropology and osteology which they did not have mm -hmm. we had a linguist I don't believe they had a linguist the the administration at Wake Forest University the president the dean and everybody signed off on it mm -hmm. we'll do it yeah we'll do it yeah here meeting after meeting every meeting it seemed they they would come up with another reason we couldn't do it mm -hmm. they'd say well we can't do it because of this we can't do it because we deal with you know it's another university well a and T's another university, mm -hmm. and you're moving toward a program with them. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah, that's right. Well, let's have another meeting in a month, and we'll see what other thing we can come up with. Mm -hmm. uh, and I told Bob Miller was uh, I, I forget what position he had. Maybe he was a vice chancellor or something at that, that, that time. Bob was sort of sort of supportive of it. Mm -hmm. uh, But uh, I think other people in the university, and and I couldn't get my faculty members totally behind it. Hmm. All the faculty members at Wake were behind it. Right. We invited them. I invited them all over to give talks here. Right. We went over to Wake and gave talks at their university. I right. went. We did all of this. All of this stuff. I thought, you know, I'm, and I told Bob Miller. Bob Miller said, I remember this distinctly. He said. Why don't you just go for a PhD? Which indicated he was interested in supporting us. Mm -hmm. um, and I said, Bob, 
we could at best field a mediocre PhD. But what we've got here is a possibility of putting together the best master's program in anthropology in the United States mm. for the time. And I'd studied all the other master's programs mm -hmm. I brought in. We even had a, the blessing of Chapel Hill to do it. I mean, mm. North Carolina programs, Georgia programs, uh, for comparison, how successful they were. The Georgia State program had a hundred percent of their graduates got jobs if they wanted them. Wow. I said, you know, yeah. Because they were saying, well, nobody will get a job. Mm. I said, look, a hundred percent of the Georgia State graduates get jobs if they want them. Mm -hmm. and that was a fairly new program. So that was, that was a, one of the big disappointments because anthropology would be where geography is now. Mm -hmm. Geography was smaller than anthropology mm -hmm. when we were trying to put this together. Geography wound up with the graduate program, yeah. with the labs, with, with everything else, and uh, because, because we didn't move forward, we essentially moved backward in relation to everybody else, and mm -hmm. we became essentially just a service department. That's what we do. Mm -hmm. Some of the, as I understand it, some of the students will go on to graduate school, but the emphasis in the department has become a service department for arts and sciences university in general. Mm. That's, it's a legitimate thing for a department to do. Yeah. But some of us had other aspirations for what anthropology could contribute because we think of anthropology as something that has an awful lot to contribute to people's lives and to the conversations that we have at the national and state level. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I'll tell you something else that uh, was a disappointment to me. I can understand why. I'd already told you I'd worked at Southern Illinois University doing exhibits for the museum. Yeah. It was an anthropology museum. Yeah. I became a docent in the museum. School kids would come there and I would give the tours. Mm -hmm. I would work up the exhibits. Uh, and I could see the museum at Southern Illinois University, which was set up by my, started by my dissertation professor, J. Charles Kelly, mm -hmm. was always a didactic museum. The focus was always on education. Mm -hmm. Southern Illinois University is in the middle of a very impoverished former coal area, mm -hmm. Carbondale, right. uh, where the students are pretty pretty deprived of, you know, stimulus. So I mean we would get we would get in exhibits on Eskimo carvings, on antique musical instruments, on uh it's another one we Yeah, musical instruments. There was one other that went by. We had an alligator. And that was a, the kids. Man, they love that alligator. Yeah, I bet. Is it alive? Yeah. Is it alive? <laughs> uh, but, but that was the focus. Everything, every every exhibit we mounted had an educational uh, goal. So, I I mounted exhibits. In the library, I mounted exhibits in glass cases in Graham. I got some cases from the National Science Center when they redid it, and then they're still sitting outside the department, and they have exhibit stuff in them. Mm -hmm. But I tried and tried and tried to get a room, just one room, a small room, for an, a teaching museum in anthropology up on the fourth floor of Graham, mm -hmm. and I was never, I was never successful in doing that. Mm -hmm. However. I went to Mexico. From the National Geographic Project, we and UNCG worked pre previous to that. 
in the other grant money. Uh, I work with the local people and the state government and we put together uh, a museum with four rooms which we exhibit. What's about trying to think 350 to 400 artifacts from 800 to 1000 BC mm. and another room dedicated to rock art which won the state prize for the best municipal museum in the state of Jalisco. Mm. Then I put up another museum in to the south of San Blas where I did my dissertation research mm -hmm. using that information, my photos and local collections, put that museum. Then I did another museum in Ayutla, in, uh, so one room museum in, in Ayutla because we've been doing research in that area and we opened that uh, about, about two years ago. And I'm right now involved in doing a fourth museum in the area where, where we're working. So I think we can say that I could have done some really good things for UNCG mm -hmm. that I was willing to do off the skin of my back mm -hmm. with, you know, it wasn't going to cost very much and, and could have helped us in our teaching mission at UNCG. And I was disappointed that I could, I could never uh, get the backing to do that. Mm -hmm. It was my interest and I was trained in it. So, mm -hmm. uh, so uh, what else is on your, is on your list about? <laughs> um, remember anything about any of the uh, administrators that you remember? You came in under Ferguson, I think. Or did you come in under no, Moran? No, no. Uh, I'm trying to think of who was, who is the. Uh, see, Miller was arts and sciences. Okay. Stan, jo wasn't Stan Jones the? Cha I think Stan Jones was the chancellor then. Okay. And then, and then it moved to Ferguson. Mm -hmm. James Ferguson. Uh, I've known many administrators here at least mm -hmm. casually sure. <laughs> not 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 intimately sure. uh, because I haven't worked intimately with them mm -hmm. uh, I think we have been we have been blessed uh, with dedicated hard-working administrators mm -hmm. uh, Pat what's her name Sullivan Sullivan uh, I I was involved in the hiring process for Pat Sullivan, and uh, I was not in I was not in favor of hiring her, hmm. and I was absolutely wrong, mm -hmm. absolutely wrong. Uh, I've been absolutely wrong a number of times in my life, but, but if you're at, you're talking about administrators, yeah. boy, I really missed the boat because she worked herself to death here. Mm -hmm. She dedicated her heart, soul, and her life to this institution. Uh, and I, I learned to appreciate her through people who knew her more than my contact with her. Sure. And it's always nice to be proven wrong in a good way. Uh, you're sometimes also proven wrong by faculty hires that uh, I did. Among the things I learned at UNCG, and this is not only just in the Department of Anthropology, but I've been on committees in other departments and so forth for different kinds of hires. And uh, unfortunately, I found out that some people will say anything to get hired. <laughs> they will tell you anything. Will you teach? Oh yeah, oh yeah, sure, I'll teach that. You gotta have it written down on paper. <laughs> uh, that has, on a personal level, that's been somewhat disappointing because I, I tend to take people at their word. Mm -hmm. I think your word is like your sacred bond. If I say, you know, I'm going to do this, uh, you're obligated to do it. But other people don't necessarily think that way. Mm -hmm. uh, and there have been a number, I can think of a number of unnamed uh, disappointments along those lines 
when I thought people were dedicated to doing something, mm -hmm. like an administrator who was here that I thought was going to help us, uh, was convinced he was going to help us get a MA in anthropology and who said before he was hired because I was there in the interviews that he was going to do that and then did nothing. Mm. So, but, so that that has been sometimes sometimes disappointing. Mm -hmm. Other in other cases people say I'm going to do this and boy they do it. If it kills them they're going to do it. Mm -hmm. Um, and you know some pe some people have worked themselves sick here at UNCG trying to do things for their career for the department or for the institution mm -hmm. and um, bless them because um, you know when we think of nice nice things around here we think of what what they did mm -hmm. um, the students the student body has changed considerably I told you what it was like when I got here. Right. The student body is tremendously more diverse now. Uh, it is. It was inconceivable that we would have a black chancellor when I was here. Mm. It was inconceivable when I was here. You know, I came up with the idea. I said, you know, why don't we develop programs with A&T? I mean, they're just across the road, yeah. Oh, no, oh, no, you yeah. know, we would lose our support from our alumni. Mm. Yeah, I'm, I'm telling you, that's, but that's, you know, yeah. they, they may have been right, unfortunately, yeah. right? But I said, you know, we could be an example. We're just primed for an example of getting, well, you know, there's a the quality of the programs. And, well, I, these are all excuses for not doing what should be done. Mm -hmm. Fortunately, social work, they opened up that door mm -hmm. and I think there have been more and more joint projects later on. Mm -hmm. uh, so, I mean, you walk around the campus and you see, I mean, we're not just talking about blacks, black students, which are abundant at UNCG now, we're talking about a large Asian contingent mm -hmm. too. Uh, but they must think, you know, in China that Greensboro is a nice place to send Lucy Lin or whatever the heck it is, because there's an awful lot of Asians also coming here. Of course, it may have something to do with the kinds of programs that we have. But our faculty has become much more diverse, our student body is much more diverse. Our student body is also much more diverse in terms of their academic abilities and backgrounds. Mm -hmm. And I could see that developing before I left. Okay. Uh, you know, I'd, I'd wind up failing a certain number of the students in my class, either because they weren't able or weren't willing. And they might not have been able because they're working a full-time job and trying to go to school. Mm -hmm. They might not have been willing because they, you know, just weren't academically inclined and, well, going to UNCG sounds like a good idea. I couldn't get into Chapel Hill or State. Uh, so you get, you get some of those, too. Another change that I saw before I got out of this place was an increasing intervention of parents in the academics of the students. Hmm. The first 20 years I would hear, was here, or 30 years I was here, you would never have a parent call you up and say, how come you're flunking Susie? Mm. Or whatever it happened to be, usually with some kind of crisis like that. Mm -hmm. I mean, that one, one uh, father who threatened to get s some of his buddies together and come over and beat me up. Really? Over nothing. It was really nothing. The, the policy in the class was, if you miss more than six, every one after that, you get five, five points knocked off your final grade. Mm -hmm. His daughter hadn't missed six. She missed like five, but he was going to come over and beat me up. Uh, 
parents calling up and saying, you know, you can't, you can't flunk my son. Uh, you know, he's my only child. Mm -hmm. And she was, you know, scrubbing floors in some hotel or something. And her son had on, you know, $250 tennis shoes or, and a gold chain around his neck. I, uh, this, that sort of thing, and, and I understand from talking to other people that they've had a similar experience. Because I went, in one of the cases I, I went to administration, I said, you know, what's going on here? I mean, this is this, the second case that I've had of a parent calling me up and wanting, to, wanting me to change the grade of their student. And whoever was in the legal office over here said, you only had two? Mm. Oh, no, you're lucky. Oh, no, this happens all the time all over campus. Uh, so maybe this is a feed-in from grade school, high school, I don't know. But it, it is a change. Mm -hmm. uh, a change that uh, is, is, cert is certainly not a welcome change because if a student comes here, they are presumably adult enough to handle whatever problems they have. Um, maybe they've got a lousy teacher. Maybe I'm a lousy teacher. Uh, but they've got to learn to negotiate, navigate these things. Mm -hmm. So. That was another. That's another change. The campus physically, of mm -hmm. course, because I, I don't remember if Moran or Ferguson who set the master plan mm -hmm. for the campus, but this place, you know, apart from about three or four buildings, looks nothing like it looked like when I got here in 1969. Wow. Yeah. Oh yeah. I mean, and all the changes are for the better. I mean, I. I could not have imagined that this place would look like this by the time I left. So physically the students are going to a much better university in terms of classroom, mm -hmm. size, equipment, desks, projections, student union, uh, all of these things. I have not, I was on the committee on athletics mm -hmm. for a while. I have never been for UNCG moving into the semi-professional athletics in anything. Mm -hmm. I was always for, and I wouldn't keep my mouth shut, I thought that UNCG should put their money into the intram intramural program mm -hmm. and that every student who came to this campus would have the opportunity to play a sport if they wanted to play a sport mm -hmm. or do a sport if they wanted to weight lift or whatever yeah. and they would get coaching or help or, uh, because when I was at Southern well you know I like sports mm -hmm. <laughs> and I've never been very good at them mm -hmm. but I love you know doing it when I was at Southern Illinois University Southern Illinois University decided they were going to have a, you know, a championship football team. So they were going out and recruiting all of these hotshot high school football players because they wanted to have this nationally recognized team. Mm -hmm. Well, they assessed everybody in graduate school a certain amount of money as well as the other students, but also the grad students who could hardly afford it. Mm -hmm. uh, let, let's say they were going to assess them $200 a semester toward buying this football team. Mm. So one of my friends in the graduate school, Matt Hill, said, well, I'll go along with this, but only on two conditions. That they build a stadium big enough so that all of the students can sit in the stadium to watch the game mm -hmm. and that they choose the players at random from the student body. <laughs> <laughs> what a team. Yeah, what a team. But what a, wouldn't that have, that have been interesting to yeah. see? I mean, wouldn't it be interesting if everybody did that? Yeah. Uh, 
so I think I don't know what the intramural program is is like here. I hope they have continued to develop it because it's a lot better if you're a student and you can play basketball rather than a student who can go sit someplace and watch somebody else play it. Mm-hmm. That's that's always been my always been my feeling. Mm-hmm. Something else about UNCG you want to know? Yeah. Yeah. Anything else you can think of at the moment? Anything uh, else I can think of about UNCG? Let's see. Any uh, social or academic events that stand out in your mind? Oh yeah. Let's get on that. Uh, I was on the Harry Elliott committee mm-hmm. for a while. Mm-hmm. Um, some things stood up that stand out in my mind. Well, we'll go there first. Some of the people who have come here to to talk in the Harry Elliott lecture mm-hmm. series have been anthropologists or archaeologists, and it has given us a chance to get that before the public, uh, more public into contact with these people. And I mentioned uh, Don Johansson mm-hmm. was here, um, Mary Leakey came here, Mauve Leakey, mm-hmm. her daughter came here. Uh, We had the, trying to think of his name, the head of the anthropology program at NSF Mm -hmm. came and talked about his research in South America. Um, uh, I got here, uh, when I was head of the department, I got David uh, George Stewart from National Geographic and David Stewart, his son. Mm -hmm. His son published his first article on Maya hieroglyphs, I think when he was nine. Wow. He wound up with a MacArthur Genius Grant. Jesus. Yeah. And I got them here as a pair (laughs) to give a talk. Oh, that's fun. On Maya archaeology. Yeah. Uh, That that was another. And, And I think, you know, that has enriched the university in many other departments, but I just, those are people I remember came here and we had contact. We brought um, Margaret Mead, it was Margaret Mead came here. Yeah, Margaret Mead came here. What, like f- the first or second year that I was here. Uh, <laughs> Jimmy Griffin, Southeastern archeologist, came here. Margaret Mead, <laughs> I tell you. Margaret Mead would not talk to the faculty. Really? No, she gave she gave a, it was a large uh, classroom. Mm-hmm. She gave her talk. It might have been over in in, in Graham when that was brand spanking mm-hmm. new. Uh, but she would only talk to students. Mm-hmm. See, she did her work with young people. Mm-hmm. Uh, coming of age in Samoa was her big monograph. Gotcha. And uh, she was especially interested in girls coming of age. Mm-hmm. Uh, so we thought, oh boy. Harriet Cupfer, we always call her Cup, mm-hmm. Cup's going to have a reception for the faculty out at her house. Mm-hmm. And they had just moved out to their new house in the country. It's a beautiful place. Uh, so Margaret Mead won't talk to us, won't answer any questions that we, but we'll get a we'll get a chance to talk to her, out at Cups. So you know I was there and I listened to her talk. It was a very interesting talk, and she very good rapport with the students. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I recall she was walking with a cane at that time, walking stick or something. Well, man, I went home and I said, we'll, we'll eat something out of cups, I guess. Or, uh, my wife didn't go along. I, j- I guess just the faculty w- was invited. Mm-hmm. And I got out there early. I think I may have been the first one. Ron McIrvin might have been on my heels. When I sure. Got out there and cup met us. And, Hello, you know, how are you doing? You know, you know, you know, you know. <laughs> where's Margaret Mead? Uh-huh. Yeah. 
Oh, she's she's uh, resting in the bedroom. They had gotten there after her talk, and they had had liberal cocktails of some sort, and she was passed out on the bed. Oh my gosh! <laughs> and so we had the reception <laughs> at Cup's house, and we did we got to talk to Margaret Mead at all. <laughs> but uh, you know there were experiences like that. Sure. There was also. Um, Warren Ashby's uh, he started the dialogue series mm -hmm. and also Warren Ashby's big thing another thing that I was wrong about uh, the residential college experience residential college still going yeah that's great that's wonderful I was not in favor of it mm -hmm. I thought it was it didn't meet my model of what the university should be doing and I said I wasn't didn't think it was a good idea and so forth uh, but the department needed somebody to teach. <laughs> well, Mount Joy will do it. Mm -hmm. So uh, I got together with Warren and I developed a course in introductory anthropology where I would present a topic. It could be, let's say, coming, coming of age in primitive society. So sure. we're on the topic. Sure. If we were in sociocultural anthropology in the relevant material and I would give the students a bibliography and the students would go to the library and they would come back the next class because I think we met like once once a week like give them the thing on Friday they'd come back next Friday and they would present what they had come up with and they would give me their papers and we'd have this three-hour free-for-all discussion or two hours, it was two hours, and then I would present a topic in an hour and give them another bibliography. Mm -hmm. I had about 20 students. That was the most successful course I ever taught at UNCG. It sounds really fun. Yeah, it was, they loved it. Yeah. They loved it, I loved it. I could tell they were getting a lot out of that course. Mm -hmm. uh, then I went back to the department, I told Cuffer, who was the head of the, I said, you know, we really ought to do this on a regular basis. I said, you know, this we ought to t we ought to take the same model mm -hmm. and apply it in the courses that we have here. Mm -hmm. She said, well, you can't do that. We can't do that. I mean, you've got to teach 50, 50 students in the classroom. Mm -hmm. You can't teach fifteen students. And so it died. Right. So a really good thing that I didn't think was going to be good, but turned out excellent in practice could not be put into practice in a wider context of the department mm -hmm. because we needed to produce student numbers. Sure. So, mm -hmm. that was another a good mm -hmm. good thing that good thing that came out at yeah. UNCG and I'm also let me say that I sang at UNCG all the time. I sang here they had an oratorio society. Mm -hmm. Um we sang, uh, what was that? Uh, oh, boy. how easily I forget. One of the toughest choral pieces imaginable. I'd done Stravinsky, and it was tougher than Stravinsky. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll probably think of it. Okay. Uh, but they had a, chor a choral group here. Was I was with that group. Uh, I wound up uh, singing the in the opera, uh, the Greensboro Opera yep. Society. Greensboro Opera Company. I think seventeen operas uh, under Richard Cox, mm -hmm. who directed us for many years. Yep. A wonderful man. Mm -hmm. Good night. What a what a wonderful guy. Mm -hmm. uh, and he was wonderful to take me in, and I'd worked like crazy. Uh, uh, Richard Cox and then uh, Holly, David Holly. I sang under David Holly, also another wonderful guy. And um, that's where I get my wonderful experiences in music. I got into community theater, did Music Man. Mm -hmm. Then I got into Livestock Playhouse, did about 11 shows Oklahoma, mm -hmm. George M., um, Mame. Uh, oh, again. It's the music that has made 
things more enjoyable when a lot of the stuff was drudgery sitting in my office working up classes, writing articles, books, and so forth, the lonely stuff, uh, and working with people in theater, many of them, of course, were in the School of Music here that sang in the opera with, with me, mm -hmm. or were in livestock players uh, out of the School of Music. Uh, people in music and theater are generally wonderful people. Mm -hmm. It is amazing to me, and I've commented about this until people are tired of me hearing, or tired of hearing about it. You get in a department, an academic department, and the people in the ac academic department are in competition. Mm -hmm. They're in competition to become associate or pro professors, they're in competition to get more time to write more books, uh, to get grants. Uh, it's a very, very competitive environment. And going through, I thought about this, going through graduate school, it's also an extremely competitive situation, even mm -hmm. undergraduate school. Mm -hmm. You go through academics is extremely competitive. Well, it doesn't get less competitive when you get into graduate school. And then you have to write a dissertation. So some people wind up in the library working for months on a dissertation. It's a solitary, mm -hmm. lonely existence. Or they're writing books or whatever. And now, heavens, I'm no, you know, that's a very solitary, lonely kind of endeavor. But when I get together in a production of an opera or a production of a play or a musical theater or whatever, everybody's nice mm -hmm. and everybody cooperates. Nobody's nasty. In all the operas I ever sang in and they're bringing in people from the Met and all over creation to sing the principal roles, there was only one diva in the negative sense that that I ever ran into. The rest of the people were just like your best next door neighbor. Mm -hmm. I've never been able to figure this out exactly. <laughs> I think it's because when you're in a production, a musical production or play or movie or whatever it is, everybody depends on everybody else to do their best. Mm -hmm. And you want, if you're the star of the show, you want that person who comes on the stage for five minutes to do their job the best they can possibly do, and you're going to help them. Mm -hmm. <laughs> if you've got to sit and go over lines with them, you're going to mm -hmm. help them, mm -hmm. because that helps you. But that does not tend to be the case in the academic setting. I think that's a shame. Yeah. I think that we should we should be able to co cooperate more, but I'm I'm good at comp I'm good at competing. Mm -hmm. I mean I I'm, mm -hmm. I played sports. I'm good at competing, mm -hmm. but it life is a lot richer, more fulfilling mm -hmm. if you're with people who are friendly and that everybody's cooperating toward common goals. That's yeah. just what I want. My philosophic <laughs> philosophical statement. <laughs> Anything else about UNCG? Well, I was going to get to the wrap-up stuff anyway. It's like 3.15. It's like 3.15? It's like 3.15. Well, let me say something about what I've done after UNCG, and okay. then you can wrap up. Yeah, let's do that. Okay. Uh, because I'm constantly running into people who say, oh, you retired. from." Well, not really. Uh, I did the National Geographic Project, mm -hmm. 2001 to 2005. Uh, then I took phased retirement at UNCG mm -hmm. and used the phased retirement to work myself into a position as a research professor with the University of Guadalajara. Okay. And so it was sort of my dream job. Like many dreams, the actual the actuality doesn't turn out to be exactly how you dreamed it. Mm -hmm. uh, but I, all I can say is. That's what I wanted to do, so if I don't like it, it's my mm -hmm. own darn fault. Sure. 
but I the research professor position only requires requires me to teach one course. Okay. I teach Mexican archaeology in the tourism program in Puerto Vallarta. That's a, the strong program in the campus at Puerto Vallarta. Uh, I teach on Fridays, three hours on Friday, and the rest of the time I do research, it's, which amounts right now to digging on a site that's 800 years old and has literally tons of material, mm -hmm. tons of material. We dug on it two, two months last year before the rains knocked us out, mm -hmm. and in two months we recovered over 18,000 potsherds. Wow. Plus shell, plus bone, plus yeah. cotter, copper, plus obsidian, plus, uh, you know, so it's just an incredibly rich site. Uh, but that, ha that has allowed me, finally, to be near the sites I work on mm -hmm. and to be able to analyze and write up this stuff really throughout the year. So my produ productivity shot way up because I'm not, you know, before I was, you know, two days after I gave my final exam at UNCG, I was on the plane headed to Mexico and mm -hmm. then I'd work like crazy and I'd come back here and I'd write up the report for the for the government and whatever else I could do, mm. but I had all the other stuff to do, and then I'd back down there for another summer. Now, now I can work myself to death <laughs> on <laughs> on the research on the research end, mm -hmm. and I'm also trying to teach Mexican students about the pre-Hispanic past of their own country. Mm -hmm. But I also wind up teaching them geography, mathematics, uh, history, mm -hmm. Spanish, uh, because many of the students are extremely poorly prepared by the system in Mexico okay. to tackle anything that you could call college work. Mm -hmm. So that that has been a challenge, but it is it has forced me to change pretty radically how I teach. Mm -hmm. I teach three hours basically without notes mm -hmm. because I stand right in front of the class and I'm looking right at them mm -hmm. and they can't fall asleep. Right. And I'm asking them questions of what happened two classes ago. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm just giving you examples. I would be a much better teacher at UNCG right now than I was when I left here. Mm. Just because of being forced to change my methods of teaching to, to suit the, the reality of the students that I have. Mm -hmm. uh, it has its rewards. As I said, they voted me best teacher once <laughs> one year. <laughs> I, have, I still don't know. I, I figure the competition must have been really, really poor. <laughs> because, you know, it's my second language, <laughs> uh, but it's it's good it's good to see that I can teach them and some can get excited mm -hmm. and you know and I hold their feet to the fire. Yeah. But but it's it's made me certainly it's made me certainly a different teacher, mm -hmm. and it's allowed me in Mexico to put together these museums and I always did, wanted to do the museum work. Mm -hmm. um, so, the research is pretty much winding to close because I don't want to drop dead in the middle of a project. But the, the National Geographic project that I did, mm -hmm. it was five years of work in the field and took us seven years after that to analyze, photograph, draw, and work up for publication and get it published in a book. Mm -hmm. So that's a five-year project in seven years to do the rest. I've got a one-year project now, so I could easily have three, four, or five years to work on this material. Mm -hmm. uh, I figure if I make if I can make it that long, I'm I'm really a very fortunate guy. So I so I will I will 
be as active as I can as an archaeologist, mm -hmm. teaching and doing research like crazy, as long as I can possibly do it, and my wife will tolerate my doing it. Uh, as I said, she's Mexican, so mm -hmm. uh, when she goes to Mexico, she goes home. Mm -hmm. uh, and we have a nice ranch. We have a horse that's never been ridden, like a big dog. <laughs> a three-legged dog, because angry neighbor shot off one of his legs. Oh. Uh, three cats, uh, two canaries. I think that's about it. But Sounds we live out in the country, and we have a garden, and we, it's a nice climate. You know, it's 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 very nice. It sounds very great. nice. So, so that's what I'm doing now. All right, that sounds great. So it sounds great to me. It, it sounds really nice. Um, is there anything about UNCG you wish we hadn't? We wish we had talked about that we didn't get to. I don't think there is okay. anything that I can that I can think of. Certainly, we covered all major major aspects, yeah. uh, both the pros and some of the cons. Mm -hmm. uh, this is just the the reality of the place. So yeah. it makes sense. All right, so we've got like two wrap up questions, and then uh, I'm gonna let you go. Okay. So um, no, I'm gonna let you go. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I have to get back to work after this. Yeah, anyway. I figured it. Yeah. Um, so tell me how UNCG has affected your life and what it means to you. Is the second to last question. Okay. Uh, first of all, UNCG gave me a job. Yeah. <laughs> I will always be grateful to UNCG for having enough faith and confidence in me to say, sign here, we're going to give you a job. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, I hope that they got a good deal when they did that. I have always tried to do the best I could to provide the things that I thought UNCG wanted me to provide. Mm -hmm. uh, I've not always been successful in it, but they gave me the job, they supported my research, they gave me a good place to work. Uh, eventually they had us in a bad place, a <laughs> bad building to start with. Mm -hmm. We eventually got good accommodation, accommodations, they gave me a laboratory to work in. Mm -hmm. Uh, I did work in North Carolina with students as well. We did several projects here. Um, so basically, basically that is it. Of course, along with that, they gave me an academic environment in which I could at least potentially flourish. Um, I wish they had gone the extra mile and gotten us into a master's program, it would have enriched a lot of aspects of our my professional life and also the academic s situation at UNCG, but you know, we've, we've gone over that. Yeah. What's, what's the last one on your... So the last question is, these interviews are for the 125th anniversary of UNCG, which gives us a time to look back on where we've been, but also look at the future. So where do you think UNCG is going to be like in the next 25 to 50 years? Are we, are any of us going to be here in the next 25 or 50 years? I'd like years? to hope so. <laughs> I mean, I'd like to I hope mean, so. You're, you're, you're really uh, pretty positive and <laughs> optimistic about <laughs> the future of things, aren't you? Yeah. Uh, where is UNCG headed? Well, since I haven't had really close contact with UNCG for the last 10 years. Right. Uh, I would hope that what UNCG would do is that UNCG would continue to support, to encourage good teaching and learning experiences for 
its students. Mm -hmm. And to me, the basis of all learning is research. The asking of questions and the attempt to come up with some kinds of answers. Without questions, the whole enterprise falls flat. And so, I would hope that UNCG would continue to encourage and develop the involvement of undergraduates and graduates in research, funded or non-funded, small classes with intimate contact with the professors, which has always been sort of a hallmark of UNCG. You just don't get TAs for the two first two years. Mm -hmm. um, these intimate relationships with professors in research questions are the things that tend to shape people for the rest of their lives. That I would hope. I would hope that they would never get a football <laughs> team on this campus. <laughs> that they would continue to provide enriching experiences for the students in intramural sports and in activities like theater, music, uh, these enriching things, even though you're not in that particular school, mm -hmm. the cross-fertilization of the schools, uh, to promote that, I mean, I, I've been lucky to have good friends in sociology, in physics, in chemistry, in political science. It would be, UNCG has tried and has been successful to some extent in getting faculty together. Unfortunately, a lot of the getting the faculty together has been getting the faculty together to work. Mm -hmm. Well, you're not working in your office. We're going to put you to work on this. We'll get you on this committee. But I think I would hope, and I say this because it's absolutely lacking institutionally in Mexico where I work. That's where I see the stark contrast. Mm -hmm that the university could get the faculty together to, dis to discuss things. Not to work, but to enrich one another's understanding of things, to bring up different points. Uh, doesn't have to be, you know, like, well, somebody, the physicist's going to give a talk, you know, on Friday. To somehow or another cross-fertilize the disciplines in a more informal way so that it enriches the academic life of the of the professors and potentially the students. Mm -hmm. I would hope that they could do that more. <laughs> <laughs> I tried to do it when I was in anthropology mm -hmm. uh, with, with some success. Uh, with having the anthropology faculty give talks on campus and inviting the whole campus to come listen and comment and so forth. But I'm thinking of, I'm thinking not just of that, I'm thinking of something that is more informal, more cross for life, where the faculty might get together and discuss something current in the news that's academic. Look at Discover Magazine. Mm -hmm. They have the hundred, every year they put out the hundred most important discoveries in the sciences, uh, or most important discoveries, mainly in the sciences, in the past year. You could take any one of those. <laughs> habitable, finding habitable planets or something, mm -hmm. and talk about, you know, should we look for them? Should we fund all of this stuff? Uh, how many have been found? You know, so that the academic environment of the institution does not become sterile classroom type academics, but also involves the students and faculty in a more 
interactive, informal way, intellectually. Intellectually. The intellectual environment of the university mm -hmm. should never be forgotten. 